Story 1. Hey everyone, I didn't think I'd post again so soon, but here I am. I reduced my encounters with troublesome customers by about 99% just by quitting my retail job. This story is about the remaining 1%. Before we start, here's a bit of backstory. I'm currently in my first semester of college, and so far everything is great except for my commute. I live in a small town, and to get to campus, I have to take the train, which passes through two large cities before reaching my stop. The train ride is about 40 minutes in both directions, and these trains are used a lot. I have to get up early because the train ride is long, and I also have to take a bus after that. I don't like getting up early, so I try to catch some extra sleep during the train ride. Theft isn't a big issue in my country, but since there are a lot of people on the train, I've developed a technique to keep my backpack and jacket secure while I rest. I place my backpack on the seat next to me with the zippers facing my side and my jacket on top of it. As an additional security measure, I put my arm through the straps of the backpack so no one can easily take it. This morning, I was on the train again, holding my backpack and jacket to ensure no one could take them without me noticing. I was more tired than usual because I have my first exam coming up on Friday wish me luck, so I dozed off quickly. I was almost asleep when I felt my backpack being ripped away from me. Since I had my arm in the straps, I woke up abruptly and panicked, pulling my arm back. I'm not very strong, but the person trying to take my backpack was even weaker than me. I pulled my arm and my backpack back, which caused the person, an elderly woman we shall call Karen, to fall face first into the seat. I wear headphones on the train, and my music is pretty loud which might be important for what follows. I was annoyed at being woken up, but I decided to check on Karen to see if she was injured. As soon as I took out my headphones and sat up, she started yelling at me. She accused me of assaulting her and said I was in big trouble and that she was going to call the police. She repeated this for about two minutes. When she finally paused, I asked, what were you thinking, yanking my backpack away from me? Seriously. What reaction were you expecting? She continued her rant, trying to get the other passengers on her side. It seemed to work until the woman sitting diagonally from me spoke up, saying, Seriously though, why would you try to steal his backpack and then be surprised when he wouldn't give it to you? Karen got even angrier and yelled, Steal his backpack. The audacity, I was trying to get this kid's attention because nothing else was working. I should mention that the train has three types of seats, two sets of two seats facing each other, regular sets of two seats, and foldable seats for bikes or wheelchairs. The most comfortable seats are the ones facing each other, as the other ones either have no legroom or can get cramped. The common etiquette is to first occupy the seats facing each other, then move to the non-facing seats, and finally to the foldable seats if the other seats are taken. Karen didn't get the memo and wanted to squeeze into the four seats already occupied by me and the woman I mentioned earlier. Usually, I wouldn't mind, but this was a special situation. 1. She woke me up. 2. There were plenty of free seats. 3. We have a thing called coronavirus going around, so you shouldn't sit right next to a stranger if other seats are available. Karen seemed to calm down and I finally figured out what happened. She wanted to sit in the seat my backpack was on, but couldn't get my attention. Instead of looking for another seat or trying to get my attention politely, like tapping my shoulder, she decided it was a good idea to try to take my backpack, which could be considered attempted robbery. She continued ranting, while the woman and I were still in shock. The other passenger started to side with us, so in an anticlimactic turn of events, Karen decided to exit the train. That was pretty much it, except I was tired and missed too much of my lecture. Story 2 Two years ago, my mom had the first of two strokes that left her disabled and eventually led to her death 19 months later. She complained of a headache for a few days, and I'd asked about going to the ER, but she said it was getting better. The next morning she displayed symptoms like she had with a previous stroke confusion, shuffling gait, etc. Not the usual symptoms, but I knew. Since an ambulance would take her to the worst hospital in the county, 
I convinced her to get in an Uber with me to go to the doctor's office, really to the Ur, but she would have refused if I said that. By the time we got to the Ur, I knew would treat her well. She was having trouble walking so I grabbed a wheelchair and wheeled her in. I told the front desk her info and that she was having the symptoms of a stroke, then went to sit with her. About three minutes later a nurse came out and took us right back to a room. Apparently there was a lot of grumbling from the others in the full waiting room, which I was too stressed to notice. A friend was coming to meet us, and she had to sit in the waiting room for a few minutes. She shared the rest of the story. She arrived about ten minutes after she we were taken back and walked in to hearing people complain amongst themselves. Eventually people were going up to the desk angry, saying it was unfair some of them had waited for hours and my mom had gotten special treatment. I guess some even raised their voice because the nurse who'd gotten my mom heard them from the triage room and stormed out into the waiting room. He outright yelled at everyone about how people are seen in order of who is sickest, and that woman who was taken back right away had a stroke, and there was a very limited amount of time to save her life. A few people tried to keep complaining, and he yelled again that anyone unhappy about it could walk right out the door and go to any of the other dozen hospitals in the metro area. He then called a security officer down to make sure no one started any further issues. Moral of the story, if you go to an IR and they mail you wait, be thankful. It likely means you're not going to end up disabled or dead. Story 3 This morning, I was out mowing my lawn. I happened to be wearing an old t-shirt with a logo from a video game I enjoy playing. We live in a very small town in northern Wisconsin where everyone generally minds their own business. Because of this, we haven't had much interaction with our neighbors, which is fine with us. One of the houses next to ours is a rental property that the owners converted into a duplex. The bottom half is empty, and there are two adults a man and a woman who live in the upper unit with two kids. I have never spoken to the parents, as they have never made an attempt to even give the neighbor wave when we see them outside. However, this morning, the mom started walking over towards me, so I stopped the lawn mower and said good morning. She commented on how we have such a big house. I told her it was because we like having lots of pets, four cats and two dogs, and that we usually adopt animals with medical issues since I am a nurse and my niece is a veterinarian. We made a little more small talk, and then I went back to finishing mowing the lawn. After that, I went inside to do some other chores when I heard a knock on the door. I checked the cameras and saw two kids standing at my door. I make it a policy not to interact with children who do not have a parent with them, especially because I am a gay man. Given the current political climate, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. So, I ignored the knocks and continued with my chores. A few minutes later, the woman I had spoken to earlier was standing there, so I opened the door. She was upset that I had ignored her children when they came over, as they wanted to play with our pets. I told her that I would never allow children in my house without a parent, and that our pets were not play toys for her children. She then asked if they could play video games since I must be a gamer because of the shirt I had on. I reiterated that I would never allow children without an adult in our home. She then started going on about how she needed some alone time because her boyfriend had left her. She was the only one on the lease because he had bad credit, and she couldn't afford the rent. She just needed some time to herself. I apologized that she was having a rough time, but explained that my husband and I would not be willing to entertain her children for her. She looked perplexed for a bit, and I was curious about what had confused her. Then she said something that made me lose it in a major way. She said, Gross, why do people like you have to be my neighbors? I replied. Look here, you nasty person. You will never say that to me or my husband again. You need to leave right now. And I slammed the door in her face. She kept pounding on our door, screaming all kinds of slurs and obscenities. Because we have had some issues with kids destroying property, we have cameras all over the outside of our house. So I turned on the alarm on all of them. She got the message then and left. Like, what the actual heck? I have never been so glad to have cameras everywhere outside. Story 4 It was early 2020, just before the world was engulfed by the grip of COVID-19. 
Back then, I had a deep passion for cosplaying, immersing myself in the world of characters and costumes. This particular tale unfolded at Pack South, where I found myself attending for the very first time, accompanied by my aunt and cousin. I had chosen to portray Celestia Ludenberg, a captivating character from the semi-popular video game called Danganronpa. My cousin had joined in the fun, donning the attire of Mikan, another character from the same game. Together, we embarked on an unforgettable adventure. Throughout the day, we indulged in the joys of Pax South, taking countless photos with fellow cosplayers and diving into thrilling video game experiences. It was an absolute blast, and the excitement seemed to grow with each passing moment. However, as our departure drew near, fate interjected in the form of a young child. She appeared before me, around nine years old, introducing herself as Callie, though that was most likely a pseudonym. Eagerly, she asked if she could take a picture with me. Regrettably, I explained that I was on the verge of leaving and feeling exhausted. Yet, I offered a compromise. If you can find me at the cafe area tomorrow, we can take a picture then. To my delight, her face lit up with renewed enthusiasm, and she promptly scurried off to a nearby table. And then, as if summoned by misfortune, a certain Karen emerged from the depths of chaos. This woman stormed toward me, anger etched on her face, and unleashed her fury, demanding to know why I had refused her child's request for a photo. Backing away, I tried to reason with her, explaining that I was about to leave, but gladly offered to take the picture the following day. However, my words seemed to incite her further. With an unsettling determination, she seized me by the arm, forcibly dragging me along, insistent that I pose for a photo with her child at that very moment. Panicked, I kicked out instinctively with one of my heeled shoes, inadvertently connecting with the woman. Immediately, she erupted into a performance worthy of an Oscar, accusing me of assaulting her. Help, help, this heathen assaulted me, she wailed feigning tears for dramatic effect. I looked up, meeting the gaze of her child, who appeared crimson-faced, no doubt embarrassed by her mother's behavior. Thankfully, a security guard rushed to the scene, promptly intervening and urging the Karen to leave. Defiantly, she pointed at me, continuing her outburst. She assaulted me. I demand her arrest. Caught off guard, I found myself at a loss for words, simply staring at her in disbelief. Realizing that her tale was met with skepticism, she lunged at me once more, hurling insults my way words I won't dignify by repeating. Unfortunately, the weight of my costume prevented any meaningful retaliation. In the midst of this chaotic spectacle, the unexpected occurred. The Karen, driven by her blind fury, leaped onto my leg, resulting in an audible crack that reverberated through the crowd. Shock consumed me, rendering me unable to shed a single tear. How does that feel, you witch, she taunted, reveling in her cruel act. A heavy silence enveloped the scene, the tension palpable as it hung in the air. My voice pierced through the stillness, resonating with a mix of anger and disbelief. You witch, how dare you harm me over a mere picture, I'm going to sue you. The words thundered from my mouth, shaking the confidence of the Karen. At that moment, my aunt arrived, Witnessing me sprawled on the floor, while the Karen stood flabbergasted. I could see the fury in my aunt's eyes, but she restrained herself, mindful of the presence of the security guard. Taking swift action, the guard promptly restrained the Karen, slipping handcuffs around her wrists. He called for backup and an ambulance, informing her, Ma'am, you are under arrest for assaulting a minor. The Karen's screams filled the air as she was escorted away leaving her child's father to pick up the pieces of the bewildering situation. When my mother learned of the incident, her fury knew no bounds. She wasted no time in pursuing legal action against the Karen. However, in a baffling turn of events, the Karen retaliated with a counterclaim of emotional abuse. The legal proceedings finally commenced in March, with the presence of the young girl and her father in the courtroom. To my surprise, the father approached me and offered a sincere apology on behalf of the woman. He confided that he had initiated divorce proceedings, though the outcome remained unknown. I hoped that he would gain full custody of their child, ensuring a safer environment for her. As we gathered in court, the Karen's hostile glare fixed upon me, 
accompanied by inaudible muttering, likely laced with profanities, I paid her no mind, refusing to let her intimidation affect me. The court proceedings moved swiftly, lasting only a week, as nobody had the patience to endure the Karen's absurdity. Astonishingly, she had the audacity to demand $10,000 us from me, alleging emotional abuse due to my threat of a lawsuit. I couldn't believe her nerve. She had broken my leg and attempted to forcibly drag me over a picture. Karen's outlandish statement rang through the courtroom. Karen, this girl should compensate me with $10,000 because my self-esteem was shattered. I am accustomed to always getting what I want. If she had simply taken a picture with my child, none of this would have happened. I glared back at her, astounded by her delusion. Was she truly out of touch with reality? I was then called to the stand to provide my testimony about the incident. Addressing the judge, I began, Your Honor, Miss Karen attempted to coerce me into taking a picture with her child, even after I had offered a compromise. The security guard witnessed the entire altercation. You may ask him for confirmation. Karen wore a smug expression, seemingly convinced that victory was within her grasp. The security guard stepped forward and delivered his account, substantiating my side of the story. He also mentioned the existence of surveillance footage. Karen's face visibly drained of color. Bingo. She attempted to halt the case, proposing that she would drop her claim of emotional abuse if we refrained from presenting the video. I scoffed at her futile attempt. Instead, we countersued for $15,000, seeking not only compensation but also justice. As the courtroom viewed the video evidence, it became unequivocally clear that Karen was in the wrong. The judge, now armed with irrefutable proof, addressed Karen sternly, Miss Karen, you are charged with assault of a minor. Handing down the verdict, he sentenced her to approximately two months of jail. Time and community service. Justice was served, and in addition, I received the $15,000 compensation I deserved. Story 5. Okay, I'll write a story based on the plot you provided. Following your instructions, here's the story from the protagonist's perspective. I never thought a simple trip to the farm park with my son would turn into such a crazy experience. It was supposed to be a fun day out, you know. We'd seen all the animals and were at the play area. My boy was having a blast on the climbing frame and slide with about 30 other kids. That's when she showed up. This woman walks in with a baby that couldn't have been more than six months old. She's carrying all these fancy scarves, fake flowers, and a big camera. I didn't think much of it at first, but boy, was I wrong. She starts trying to put her baby at the bottom of the slide. Every time a kid comes down, she gets more and more upset. Finally, she marches over to where us parents are standing and chatting. Woman, I need all your kids to stop playing for a bit so I can get these photos on the slide. We all just looked at her, shocked. Who does that? Me, I'm sorry, but this is a play area, not a photo studio. The kids are here to play. She didn't like that one bit. She stormed off, and the next thing I know, she's yelling at the kids at the top of the slide. My son goes up there, and I hear him ask politely if he can come down. Woman, you're so rude and inconsiderate. Can't you see I'm trying to take photos? I couldn't believe my ears. She called my kid rude for wanting to use the slide. Then she takes one of her scarves and tries to tie it across the slide to stop kids from coming down. She's getting angrier by the second. Woman, get your fucking kids out of the way. This is my photo shoot. At this point, one of the other parents went to find the park manager. Me and another dad decided to try and talk some sense into her. Me, look, our kids are here to play. It's not fair to try and stop them for your photos. There are lots of other beautiful spots in the park where you could take pictures. Other dad? Yeah, why don't you try near the animal enclosures? That could make for some nice shots. Woman? No, I want the slide. You're all just being difficult. We kept trying to reason with her, but it was like talking to a brick wall. Finally, the manager shows up. Manager, ma'am, you're creating a health and safety hazard. I'm going to have to ask you to leave the farm. Woman, what? 
You can't do that. This is discrimination. Manager, I'm sorry, but I can. Please pack up your things and go. She started shouting and swearing as she gathered her stuff. We could hear her all the way to the car park, yelling about how she was going to sue for discrimination. Me, well, that was. Something. Other dad, you can say that again. Some people, huh? We all kind of laughed it off, but I was still in disbelief. Who tries to shut down a whole playground for a photo shoot? And with a baby, no less. The rest of the day was pretty normal after that. The kids went back to playing, and us parents went back to our small talk. But I gotta tell you, that woman and her photo shoot became the talk of the day. Every now and then, one of us would shake our head and say, Can you believe that actually happened? It's funny now, looking back. At the time, it was frustrating and kind of scary, especially when she started yelling at the kids. But now? Now it's just a crazy story to tell. I mean, who goes to a busy farm park on a weekend and expects to have a private photo shoot on a kid's slide? I feel bad for that baby, though. Growing up with a mom like that can't be easy. I hope she learns to chill out a bit, for the kid's sake if nothing else. As we were leaving, my son tugged on my sleeve. Son, Dad, why was that lady so angry? Me? Some people just think the world should revolve around them, buddy. But that's not how it works. Remember, it's important to be considerate of others, okay? Son, okay, Dad. Can we come back tomorrow? Me, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. And hopefully without any more angry photographers. We had a good laugh about it on the way home. It wasn't the day I expected, but it sure was memorable. I guess you never know what you're going to get when you head out for a day at the farm. Story 6 I am a military veteran who was injured in Iraq, which is important to the story. I worked for a company that was actually owned by a guy who had a few businesses and was the richest person in a very small town. Let me explain how I ended up in this situation. I joined the military before completing high school due to late birthdays and such. I chose a military career path I thought I would enjoy, and since I love working on things, I became a mechanic. The military offered a great signing bonus, which was an added benefit. I went through basic training, only spending money on necessities, so I saved up quite a lot. By the time I finished advanced training for my military job, I had half of my signing bonus and almost a year's pay saved. At my age, most people would have splurged, but I invested in the stock market, Bitcoin, and paid off my parents' house. A couple of deployments later, with the other half of my bonus, I spent money on necessities and my hot rod. Needless to say, I had some savings and investments. Long story short, when I was discharged, I was financially comfortable despite a nasty divorce. Don't get me wrong, I didn't have an excessive amount of money. Due to the divorce, many of my stocks were cashed out and split. If you follow Bitcoin's history, you know how that turned out. After my divorce, I worked to recover what I lost and to stay busy. I love working as a mechanic and would move around, as a good mechanic can make money anywhere. After a decade of this, I decided to settle in a small town for some peace and quiet. I was tired of always working on other people's cars and wanted to devote time to my car. I bought a small house and saw a help wanted sign at the local lube shop. I figured it would be simple work to cover my few expenses. I grabbed an application from the office, getting all kinds of looks from the locals. By the way, I'm 6'3", and since my discharge, I stopped cutting my hair and shaving. Plus, I have one full sleeve of tattoos. Needless to say, most people cross the street instead of walking past me. When I turned in my application to the bookkeeper, let's call her Sue, she asked me a couple of questions, noticed I was a veteran, and put a Y on my application. Later that day, Sue called and asked if I could come back in to meet the owner. Let's call him Peter. I agreed, and Sue said Peter would be there in an hour. So if I came in then, we could talk about the position. I showed up, and Peter's eyes bulged at first sight. But we started chatting, and my southern charm won him over. He tossed me a calendar of his car collection and asked me to name the ones I recognized. There were a couple of Mustangs, a Ford GT, 
a Bricklin SV-1, a Judge, a Demon, a Pantera, and an MXT. He was impressed that I knew what the SV-1 was, and we chatted about cars for a bit. Peter offered me the position, explaining that I would be paid $100 a day, working Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., with no overtime. I would get a full day's pay even if we closed early and could eat whenever I could. I would have Sundays and one extra day off during the week. Things started great, and I worked there for about a year without issues. Then Peter asked if I could help by being a relief worker for his other lube shops in neighboring towns. He said he would give me $20 a day for travel, and I would cover for guys taking days off at the other stores. I agreed and did this for about a year. Then disaster struck when Peter met Karen, fell madly in love, and married her within a month. He started supporting her gambling problem, and that's when all the problems began. One week, I noticed my paycheck was only $250 and asked about it. Sue told me there had been some changes, and I should speak to Peter. I called Peter and asked if we could talk. He showed up with Karen, and when I asked about my pay, he said it was because of the bad weather and us closing early. I would have let it go, but Karen decided to speak up. It isn't very fair to us to pay you for a full day if you don't work the full 10 hours, she said. I explained that I was on a negotiated day rate, not hourly, which is why I didn't get paid overtime. She claimed that wasn't how it worked anymore, and from now on, I would be paid for the hours I worked and nothing else. Okay, whatever you say, Karen, I replied. Fast forward to the next week. We had several busy days where we stayed open later than normal. I also gave up one of my days off to cover for a sick coworker. So, when my paycheck, which should have been over $1.800, was only $1.600, I had questions. I called Peter and asked why. He said we agreed on $1.100 a day. I reminded him about last week, and he just said, it is what it is. At this point, I was aggravated. Then Karen walked in and asked, So what is he complaining about now? I told her I worked 80 hours last week and only got paid $600. She said, You're contracted labor, and you agreed to $100 per day. Why would we pay you more than that? I looked at Peter and asked if that was how it was. He just said, You heard the lady. I went home and convinced myself I was only working to cover my few living expenses. The job wasn't that hard, and the only other options in this small town were assembling sheds or working at a chicken plant. The next week, one of my coworkers was getting yelled at by Karen in front of customers about an Occupational Safety and Health Administration OSHA violation. She claimed it was her responsibility as part owner to ensure all OSHA regulations were met and his violation was wearing tinted safety glasses. This was nonsense because the bays faced east-west, and the top workers got the sun during the day, while the pit worker got it in the evening. I shook my head as I walked in, which attracted Karen's attention. She shouted, You got something to say, I just kept walking. I told Sue she needed to talk to Peter before Karen's behavior caused problems. Sue said, I just keep the books, don't involve me. This behavior continued for another year, and I finally reached my limit. On the day I started my malicious compliance, I was in a bad mood. I had woken up to news that a good friend who saved my life in Iraq was killed by a drunk driver. Not wanting to deal with anyone, I told the shop I would work in the pit all day and to leave me alone. The guys I worked with knew something was up, as I never did this. I thought I wouldn't have to deal with Karen since I was at the furthest shop from the main one and it was in the opposite direction of the casinos. But I wasn't so lucky, or maybe I was. Peter and Karen showed up, and she stormed into the pit, screaming for Peter to look at the mess. I had no idea what she was talking about because I always kept the pit spotless. Her complaint was about 50 oil filters stacked on my waist drums for easy access. I did this all the time, and Peter never cared. He told me, like I was a teenager, clean up this pigsty. I shook my head and said, Today's not the day. Peter, move on and take her with you. This infuriated Karen, who thought it was utmost disrespect. Peter told me if I didn't like it, I was free to leave, so I left. Now, don't freak out. The story isn't over yet. 
That's just the first flap of the butterfly's wings that started a massive storm. The next day, Peter called me and asked me to come by the main store on my way home. I thought he was going to apologize, but no. Peter informed me that for the next six months, I would be on probation and only paid $50 a day without the $20 travel allowance. I asked if he was serious and if he had seriously considered what he was doing. Peter then showed his true colors. He told me I was lucky I wasn't fired for my constant disrespect towards him and Karen. He pitied me for being a struggling disabled veteran, even though I never discussed my finances with anyone. He thought I was broke and desperate based on my appearance. Something inside me snapped, and I started laughing. He asked what was so funny, and I stood up to him like a drill sergeant, saying, you should reconsider your life choices and who you go into business with. Peter then said, what, you gonna sue me? Go ahead if you think you can afford to. What do you get from the Department of Veterans Affairs, like $1,000 a month? I know how bad you need this job. That wasn't my plan, but it kicked in my malicious compliance. I called a labor lawyer, paid the retainer, and started my lawsuit for an unsafe work environment, unpaid overtime, and minimum wage violations. I continued working there, which was glorious, but still not enough. It took about six months for my lawyer to get all the paperwork together and filed. This lawyer was a former Marine, so I think he had an idea of what I had in mind. After everything was ready, my lawyer filed the paperwork, and Peter and Karen were served at the main store while I was at work. They read the paperwork, and the process server stuck around to witness what I knew would come. When they read that I was suing them, Peter shouted, I should kick your butt, you ungrateful piece of garbage, Karen screamed. You're fired, you coward. I bet you weren't even really in the military. The process server recorded everything and gave it to my lawyer, who added unlawful termination to the lawsuit since it's illegal to fire an employee for suing you. The next day, I opened a lube shop and car wash combo and started recruiting my former co-workers at higher pay plus commission. They wanted to join the lawsuit, and my lawyer was happy to add them. Two years later, after subpoenas for security footage, books going back five years, and sworn testimonies, we went to mediation. They offered a measly $50,000 to split between the 15 of us, which didn't even cover the unpaid overtime. We declined. Then, our Apache came in to save the day, sent by the Internal Revenue Service IRS because of the company's tax documents request. Peter held each lube shop as its own limited liability company with its own tax ID and employment record. Peter and Karen filed for a tax credit for employing a veteran at each shop, claiming they employed me full-time at a minimum of 36 hours a week at a rate of $12 per hour the government gives a tax break to companies that employ veterans. At the next mediation, my lawyer presented the reports to their lawyer and the mediator. After a quick discussion, Peter and Karen agreed to settle at our request of $400,000 in unpaid overtime to be split between 15 of us, all legal fees, and a personal settlement for the unlawful termination suit of $21 for each shop. I was listed as an employee at, as well as unpaid wages for the six months, I was only paid $5 an hour. Their only demand was that we agree to a gag order so nothing would leave the mediator's table. Of course, we signed and took our paychecks. But somehow, their tax paperwork made its way to the right person at the IRS, and an investigation was opened for tax fraud. I sold the shop I opened to the guys who joined the lawsuit, each paying me $8,000, and I washed my hands of it. I put my house up for sale and moved away. Eight months later, I went back because the guy supposed to take care of the lawn was arrested, and the yard went uncut for months. The city informed me they would fine me $100 a day until it was brought to code, so I mowed it myself. While there, I checked in with my realtor and saw Sue at the front desk. Sue couldn't speak fast enough to tell me what had happened. Peter filed for bankruptcy to avoid going broke after making a plea deal for probation for tax fraud and paying a ton in unpaid taxes. Karen took off with some guy she met at a casino. I asked Sue two questions if she knew who reported the fraudulent tax paperwork to the IRS and what happened with Peter's car collection. 
she told me to check behind the realtor's office before leaving. On my way out, I peeked behind the office and saw a safety green SV1. Apparently, Peter started selling off his cars early and cheap, hoping to buy them back after filing for bankruptcy. To this day, I have no idea who, if anyone, actually reported the paperwork to the IRS. My theory is that whoever compiled it noticed something strange and reported it. However it happened, it couldn't have happened to anyone more deserving.